uh, in this uh, academic discussion. Uh, today, uh, we are here to discuss about the upper limb orthosis. As we know uh, that any orthosis functions uh, to modify the structural or the functional characteristic of a particular part of uh, musculoskeletal system. Uh, but uh, when we talk about the hand, it is very complex structure. Uh, various studies uh, says that uh, there is 27 joints, more than 100 ligaments and 34 muscles, which uh, works like an orchestra uh, with the help of the uh, planning and execution by the brain. Uh, so all these things make uh, the hand very complex biomechanically. Uh, and also the biomechanics of hand orthosis is similarly complex. If we go through the various books, uh, then we found that in some books we have a uh, better way uh, classification and in some books we get the uh, biomechanics in better way. But uh, uh, we don't have an a structured uh, complete package of the hand orthosis. Uh, so today uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Pavitra Kumar Sahu, sir, uh, to discuss, who is the head of department of uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation at uh, SV Nirtar, uh, Odisha. Uh, we will discuss uh, about the upper limb orthosis. Uh, as we know that the Dr. Sahu sir has a lot of experience in PMR practice, especially in field of uh, orthopedic rehabilitation. So uh, now over to Dr. P.K. sir. Thank you, Divakar. Uh, today's discussion is on upper limb orthosis in clinical practice. Especially we'll discuss those orthosis uh, uh, which are uh, we use clinically in our routine practice, whether any uh, uh, post-surgical uh, splint or any uh, orthosis related to different disease, disease conditions. So uh, we'll start with the uh, different uh, classification systems. My uh, presentation will include the classification of orthosis and uh, orthosis used in different clinical conditions. We'll not go in detail. I invite participants please uh, try to involve in this academic discussion. And uh, wherever any queries, also you can ask freely. And if any senior member is also joining to this, uh, his suggestion is most welcome. And any addition, any uh, uh, extra things, if somebody wants to add, uh, please open up. You can open your, uh, you can tell your ideas, you can tell your, uh, share your knowledge on this uh, upper limit thesis in uh, clinical practice. So, uh, without much wasting of time, uh, I think we should start now. Yes. Uh, if you look uh, to the introduction part of uh, definition of orthosis. Yes. So, this, there are various way, ways of describing orthosis. Basically, this is a device. Uh, which are applied to the body to stabilize or immobilize, prevent or correct deformity, protect against injury, promote healing or assist function. It's externally applied device used to modify structural and functional characteristics of neuromuscular system. So basically it works on the principle of uh, protective, corrective and assistive function. This is the basic function on which the spleen works. There are a number of ways of classification of uh, upper limb orthosis, but none of the classification system is sufficient to cover all types of conditions. That's why a number of classifications are developed. Still, the classifications are emerging in a different way. So basically, different terminologies are used to describe upper limb orthosis, like, uh, like the orthosis which describes anatomical vision or the joint that cover. And sometimes uh, this, uh, the orthosis splint is described as the purpose for which is prescribed, functions that they provide, conditions they treat, or the person who first designed them. Accordingly also, uh, the splints are named. So broadly, the most accepted classification so far is the uh, internal, uh, International Organization for Standard of ISO classification and uh, which 
normally describes a orthosis according to the anatomical region of the ortho orthosis that encompasses. Suppose the orthosis is confined to the hand only, then it is called hand orthosis, or it includes uh, wrist hand, then wrist hand orthosis, or it includes forearm wrist hand, forearm wrist hand orthosis. Includes only elbow and elbow orthosis. So it's depend upon the name depends upon the region to which the orthotic encompasses. That is ISO classification. And most accepted classification so far is the American Society of Hand Therapists Splint Classification System. That based on function of the body part that cover both covers it function as well as the body part that cover. So another uh, very vague way of classification is the historical splint classification. It depends upon, it, it almost uh, includes everything in that, but there is no uh, definite, uh, is, uh, I mean, what a, uh, different uh, types of, uh, I mean, routine web classification. So like vague way it is classified into purpose for which it is uh, used, supportive or protective or immobilized, external configuration, whether a bar splint, how it looks from outside a spring splint, what, uh, device it is uh, used and uh, sometimes depend on the power it is used whether it is externally powered splint or internally powered splint depending on the material that is used whether metal or pop or plaster what material is used uh, according to its also its name and uh, also according to anatomical part that covers covering shoulder elbow forearm wrist finger which part it is covered according to its name and uh, it's a uh, sometimes according to design categories, category of it is uh, how it is designed, it can classify it into uh, static splint and dynamic splints. Static splints are, uh, there is no motion available, continuous motions are not available. So again, it is further classified into five categories. One is non-articular, non-articular static splints that includes the splint which covers the uh, long bones especially that is that's not uh, crossing any joint like a uh, fracture splint for humerus fracture splint tibia fracture splint forearm splint like that these are all non-articular since it is confined to a particular part of the uh, limb not covering any joint then uh, another term is static splint which supports to hold a joint or uh, or the joints in a stationary form for example a knee orthosis elbow orthos. That's a static spin that just keep the uh, joint post-surgery or post-injury in a position to facilitate healing, to prevent edema. So this is how, this is just a static spin. No motion, no motions are there. Then this static spin that protects healing structures, decreases or prevent deformity. Sometimes uh, these static spins uh, prevents or decreases plasticity by giving sustained stress the of the muscles uh, across the joint so that also sometimes act as antispastic spin then third one is serial statics what is a serial static spin spin where the spin is static but periodically changed to uh, change to alter joint angle for example a, there is a uh, elbow flexion deformity you are trying to correct it by mobilization you are trying to correct by stretching so after uh, two days or three days, you have achieved some amount of extension. Then put that splint in that position. Again, go for therapy stretching exercises for one or two days. Then again, put in another position. So as, as long as the deformity is getting corrected, the splint is repositioned to a new position, especially using this low uh, temperature thermoplastics, which are uh, remoldable. These are called serial static splints, especially used for uh, serial correction of uh, deformities. Then static motion blocking spin. What is that a static motion blocking spin? Where this splint permits motion in one direction and prevents motion in opposite direction. All types of surgical repair, flexor tendons and extensor tendons. If you are repairing a tendon, you will allow movements in the direction of repair. Suppose you are repairing a flexor tendon, you will allow movements of the towards flexor, but you will not allow extension. That may stretches your repair stretches the uh, tendon you have repaired. So that, that's a static motion blocking splint. Another is static progressive splint. Static progressive splint is a, is a static, uh, that uses a static line of pull 
that is tightened periodically to increase tissue length. So there is sometimes a confusion between what is serial static, what is static progressive. Okay, so serial statics are static splints. They just reposition to another fixed position. But static progressive splints are there where the elastic bands are used to put a, to give a static line of force, like a flapper splint. That gives a static line of force that increases the joint range of motion. Okay. So these serial static positions are splints are serial repositioning provides a sustained gentle stress permitting stiff joint to regain motion. This static spin or static progressive spin. These are helpful for regaining joint range of motion in case of stiff joint with a fixed flex on the form. Then coming to what is a dynamic spin. Dynamic splint cell, that means it provides an elastic force to regain motion. So that means motion is allowed, movement is allowed across the joint where you have applied the splint. It can be dynamic motion blocking. It allows certain motion and blocks other, like as I said, like your uh, um, flexor tendon repairs, a dynamic traction splint. These are normally prescribed in case of intra-articular fractures. This, uh, this splints, gives uh, allows motion along with the traction in the joint space so that that facilitates uh, joint range of motion this is especially advised for intraarticular fractures another variety is brought with a pneumatic splint i hope you must know about the pneumatic splint used for the uh, uh, a pressure system is used air is used uh, for that splint that is especially uh, gives a uh, external pressure over the part of the limb, especially uh, in case of burn scar, hypertrophic scar. So that helps in healing of the scar. That gives a uniform pressure to prevent hypertrophic keloids or scarring. That is pneumatic splint. Tenodosis splint, another broad I mean, tenodosis splint. Uh, it uh, works in the principle of tenodesis uh, is very much useful in case of C6 spinal cord injury where you have a uh, wrist extensor is intact, but finger flexors are upset. To have effective grasp uh, that facilitates function in a hand that has lost due to nerve injury or in the case of spinal cord injury. So this sprint is called Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago or tenodesis sprint, C6 sprint, especially C6 spinal cord injury. Here, the active wrist extension produces a control finger flexor against a static thumb post. So this splint includes a static thumb, thumb post and allowing finger motion with elastic band or rubber bands. So do, by doing wrist extension, because of tenodesis function, the flexors are stressed and that helps bring the fingers against a static thumb post. That is the mechanism of a tenodesis splint. Sometimes we, we induce surgically induce a tenodesis action for uh, tetraplegics. That is, uh, the, the surgery works in the same principle of tenodesis. That is to have a effective grasp or pinch using long wrist uh, extensors of the wrist, which helps in bringing fingers, flexors or fingers to a fixed thumb. Another is CPM orthosis, the continuous passive motion orthosis. This is an externally powered device attached to uh, the forearm and uh, the rubber bands are attached to that, which is again connected to the fingers, especially mostly used for the stiff fingers. Okay, uh, that because it gives a con continuous motion, continuous rhythmic motion across the joint. So that helps in keeping the joint supple, that maintains the mobility of the joint in the healing phase. Wherever you expect a, a contracture after surgery, after skin grafting, after your a full thickness graft over the, uh, the palmar surface, you expect a stiffness because of long immobilization. You have to immobilize the fingers to keep the uh, graft viable. So uh, after that, once the graft became viable, became uh, after that, they, the patient may develop a stiffness. So in that situation, you need a continuous passive muscle, which helps in 
uh, relieving his joint tightness, make the finger supple enough for improving grasp. Adaptive devices, another group of hand splinting. This where different uh, neurological conditions where patient will have poor grasp, which hampers its activities of daily daily living. So there, a universal cough is prepared to which different adaptive devices can be attached to universal cough, which facilitates activities of daily living, whether eating, whether computer typing, typing or brushing, combing. So all these different attachments can be attached to the universal cough as per the, uh, the function, as per the requirement of the patient, as per the need of the activities of daily living. So the, these are adaptive devices uh, coming under a upper limb orthosis. Some other common terminology used in uh, upper limb ortho orthotic practice, upper limb splint practice is short opponent's hand splint. What is that a short opponent's hand splint? These short opponent's hand splints are mo mostly for, uh, uh, for immobilizing the either only CMC joint or CMC with the MCP joint or all the three joints like CMCB, CMC, MCP, a carpometacarpal joint, a metacarpophalangeal joint or IP joints. When it is indicated, it is indicated when there is no involvement of the wrist and the problems is confined to the muscles, the hand and fingers only. If it is involving the forearm, about a wrist involvement requires a long opponent's pain. In different neurological conditions, when there is a weakness of the hand, you need to stabilize your CMC. You need to stabilize your CMC and MCP or IP joints. They are the short opponent's pain used. The components of the short opponent's pain are, yeah, it has a palmar piece, it has a wrist piece. The palmar piece includes a radial extension, opponent's bar, we'll discuss what is opponent's bar, a palmar arch, a dorsal extension arch, and a bola extension arch. So basically, you need to have a thumb post. You need to have a C bar because you need to keep the thumb in 90 degree abduction to the finger plane to have an effective grasp. So this short opponent's hand splints that keep maintain the first web space, keep maintain the thumb, and there is a thumb post against which the rest of the fingers can come to come closer towards the thumb post to have an effective grasp. This is a short opponent's hand splint. It has many names. Uh, can uh, short opponent splint can uh, other way the thumb spike cast can also act like a short opponent splint. So depending upon its function, whether it is a paralytic condition, whether you are arthritic condition, what condition you are dealing with, accordingly it is named. But most of the time it is this, this short opponent's board is used for the different paralytic conditions of the hand. And these are the parts of a short opponent splint. A long opponent splint, the components uh, same as a short opponent splint along with the forearm piece. The short opponent splint is extended towards the forearm. So what happened? It immobilizes the uh, wrist along with its short, short opponent's function. This prevents any significant amount of wrist flexion or extension or deviation either radial division or ulnar division. So when the your neuro, uh, neurological conditions extends beyond wrist, involving wrist, then a long opponent splint is used. But the indications when the stability is, when you, you need a stable wrist function to improve your finger and thumb function. Okay, in case of spastic wrist flexors, you need to stabilize your wrist for a better finger uh, better grasp okay stabilize the thumb uh, in opposition for three the three three jaw chalk pins in different peripheral nerve injuries it is used in case of quadriplegia tetraplegia or in other upper upper motor neuron disorders when you need a wrist to stabilize you know in all most of the times a spastic uh, wrist the wrist has a, always a tendency of the wrist flexion it's because of over spasticity of the flexor carpi ulnaris. So any grip in flex, uh, wrist flex condition is not an ideal grip. The strength will not be adequate. So wrist need to be stabilized or little bit dorsiflexion to have an effective grasp. Okay, so this is the reason why a long opponent splint is used to stabilize the wrist along with also providing a, uh, the thumb post against which the, all the fingers will come together 
para ir para o gasp. Many times you must have seen that in your orthotic prescription or splint prescription, you advise a C-bar. What is that a C-bar? This C-bar is either in, this, uh, either in the uh, short or long opening splint. This C-bar is basically meant for uh, preventing the uh, first wave contracture, keeping the thumb in abducted position, abducted and extended position. And that is the position uh, for in which uh, one can uh, have a good grasp. So any type of grasp, your thumb need to be abducted and extended. So when do you prescribe, when do you advise a C-bar in uh, opponent splint, long or short opponent splint? When there is thumb abductors are weak, zero power or poor power, poor voluntary control, thumb abductors. When the thumb abductors are either spastic or normal. So that means the thumb will have or will always will have a tendency of going towards the palmar direction, thumb in palm. Uh, that is a bad hand and that always have a obstruction for any sort of grasp. So your thumb need to be repositioned. Your thumb need to be uh, splinted so that uh, on the process of a recovery, the hand function will recover. There will be no uh, flexor contracture. There is no first wave space contracture or thumb contracture which uh, causes hindering in grasp. Okay, so the function of C bar is to correct tightness of the web space or web space prevent web space contracture to permit the thumb thumb to oppose with the other fingers. So this C bar is a curved piece, either stainless steel or aluminum can be used normally reverted to the palmar arch of the short opponent splint or long opponent splint in such a position that it holds the MP joint of the thumb in abduction and extension. And uh, the, this thumb post should be limited to the DI joint, preferably the DI joint should be free. So next part that we have minute we have discussed so many times thumb post, thumb post. What is that thumb post? Okay, so this thumb post is essential when, when you have a paralytic hand, you need a fixed thumb against which the rest of the finger will come. Okay, that is the reason why thumb post is a, is a part of the most of the hand splints, whether long openings or short openings, you need, have, you need to have a thumb post. It's used where the active opposition and uh, thumb flexions are not sufficient for prehensor. You need, have, you need to have a stationary thumb against the mobile fingers. Okay, so indicated same, indicated in case of weak thumb abductors or poor thumb abductors with thumb abductors are normal or spastic. Okay, so the purpose of this is to statically hold the thumb in a position of prehension. That is the purpose of the thumb post. Okay, it position the thumb in a static position which helps in prehension. That's the role of thumb post. Now, this is about basic part of the uh, upper limb or of the split. Let us discuss some splint which are used for different musculoskeletal conditions and some related uh, evidences. We come across different types of sprain in our clinical practice, in our OPD practice, many patients coming with uh, different sprain. What is a sprain? Sprain is, is the injury to the ligaments. Okay, there are different grades of sprain. Mild, moderate, severe, or grade one, grade two, grade three. Grade three uh, normally requires surgical stabilization of the joint. Grade one and two can be managed by splints. So grade one are uh, normally managed by splints. Grade two can be, splint can be used. So different sprains we come across around in the hand are hyperextension injury of the MCP and IP joints, like uh, going for a catch of a cricket ball or uh, the stocking of the hand against a horse or moving object. So that causes hyperextension injury where uh, there is possible to uh, spray on the ligaments around the MCP and IP joints. Okay, so different splints used. These are all uh, prefabricated splints available in the market also. However, you can make a splint customized depending upon your condition. Okay, the common splints used for different sprain 
our finger extension splint for injury at the IP joints, uh, whether PIP or DIP joints, the finger extension splint is used. This extension splint has a, a beautiful mechanism. Why that? Is, it's not a simple thing that just putting a splint in the solve the problem. What is the, what is the reason behind it? Because this helps keep the oblique retinacular ligaments and terminal uh, extensor tendon in lengthened position. If you won't do that, any injury around the PIP or DIP has a tendency of keeping the PIP and DIP in flexor. If you keep in that position, this oblique, oblique retinacular ligaments will come down towards the volar aspect, giving rise to a bottonier types of deformity. It's a, we call it a bottom, we call it a flexion deformity of the PIP or DIP, but look to the distal, uh, distal joint. So they behave like a bottonier deformity. So you have to keep a finger extension splint, which keeps the uh, oblique retinacular ligament straightened, not lax, and also extensor tendon or the DIP in, in extended or stressed position to prevent a flexion different otherwise a bottomless deformity, right? Then, uh, hand-based thumb spike splint. Thumb spike is in why it is prescribed, when the, what is the common type of sprain? Common type of sprain around the thumb for which the thumb spike splint is advised is the gamekeeper's thumb. That is ulnar collateral ligament injury of the MCP joint. MCP joint of the thumb. That is called gamekeeper's thumb. Holding a object or directly hitting on the medial side of the thumb stretches the ulnar collateral ligament of the MCP joint. Or this medial collateral ligament of the MCP joint. So they are, uh, you have to prescribe a uh, thumb spike as even a splint for a healing of the ulnar collateral ligament injury of the uh, MCP joint. Elbow uh, wrist splint. Wrist splints are uh, functional splints used in uh, slight, used in the uh, slight extension extension position. It's a widespread use of this. It's not only used for the sprain of the wrist. There are widespread use of starting from tennis elbow, from rheumatoid arthritis. It's basically a uh, static orthosis across a joint to keep the joint in a anatomical position, relaxed position to improve healing of the inflamed structures around the joint. That's the wrist splint. Then elbow neoprene splint. Elbow neoprene splints are just elastic splints uh, used for uh, around the elbow joint, especially that helps in limiting extreme range of motion, but permits the functional range of motion. The advantage is that extreme range of motion causes further injury to the ligaments. And normal movements allows, uh, prevents uh, stiff, secondary stiffness of the elbow joint. That's why also uh, this neoprene slips are uh, advisable in case of uh, collateral injuries around the elbow joint. This is the uh, splints used for the uh, sprain. Fracture splints, you all know the, these splints are used in case of delayed union, in case wherever you are, uh, you have done conservative management with plaster cast. But uh, if you keep the plaster cast for a long period, uh, most of the plaster cast principle is that wherever there is a fracture, the proximal and distal joint both should be immobilized. So when both the joints are immobilized, they, are la they land in stiffness, they land in sudex dystrophy. Okay, so to prevent that, we need to have uh, joint range of motion on both proximal and distal uh, to the uh, fracture side. So uh, this is the fracture braces, which immobilizes the fracture, which supports the fracture, promote healing, and also allows movement to the proximal and distal joints. This movement allow improved circulation, also improves healing indirectly. So these are all fracture braces, humeral fracture base, foreign fracture base, and certain fraction splints in intraarticular fractures. They are all fracture braces and the principle behind them. These are all different types of braces. You can, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, customize it by uh, preparing, advising your uh, orthotic, prosthetic friend. You have to describe, how you have to describe what do you exactly want, what joint you need to be immobilized. Like for example, in case of TBL fracture, you have to ask them to prepare a PTB type of uh, fracture brace. So similarly, for a case of a humerus fracture base, your distal end extent most in, uh, uh, covers the polycron process of the ulna. So uh, unless you don't have a basic knowledge on this, 
you, you will have to advise your uh, prosthetic orthotic person that what type of jet splint is required and what is the proximal and uh, distal extent of the uh, fracture base. This is gutter splint, very universally used gutter splint, uh, uh, advised for many conditions, whether it is a skin grafting, whether it is a contracture, it is a stretchable splint, or it is spastic uh, contracture of the IP and DIP joints, which is stretchable. So, and in case of uh, burn contractures, also uh, a deformity, which is stretchable deformity, is gutter splints are used. It can be used as a dorsal gutter splint, it can be used as a Bowler got transplant. Depending, it, it works on the on the three point plane. Suppose this is a uh, fracture. Here you can use as a bowler uh, splint where the the pull over strap will be apex of the deformity. So one strap here, one strap here, and one strap at the apex of the deformity. This act as a three point principle, which pulls the uh, this uh, flexion towards the neutral position. Okay. The same thing you can use dorsal aspect also. Dorsal aspect, uh, one thing will be here, other will be here, but normally in case of flexion deformity, the flexion one, the severe deformity, the flexor aspect application is better. So flexor gutter splints are more advisable. Only extensor gutter splints or dorsal gutter splints are advisable when you have done a skin grafting on the volar side. So you, are, you have make it straight, you have put graft on the volar side, you want to prevent, for, prevent further flexion deformity, there you have to put a dorsal gutter splint. Why? If you put a bowler gutter splint, your grafted skin get macerated. So you have to put dorsal gutter splint with selective straps on the healthy area so that you will not much disturb to the grafted skin. So dorsal gutter splint and bowler gutter splint. Mallet splint for the mallet finger, you know, mallet uh, finger is a Abolition of the extensor tendon from the base of the distal phalanx. It normally abolishes with a, a piece of chunk of bone. That's why it's called abolition of the extensor tendon. Uh, this can this is a very commonly used splint for called a mallet splint, mallet finger splint. This keeps the uh, DIP joint in extension so that the uh, the chip bone fragment will fall back to its original position and enhances healing. This is mallet finger splint. Elbow orthosis, there are different types of elbow orthosis available. Either it can be straight elbow orthosis, simple elbow orthosis or static elbow orthosis. It can be dynamic elbow orthosis. It can be static progressive elbow orthosis. So depending upon the indication for which you are, you are prescribing. A simple elbow orthosis used for the uh, cubital tunnel syndrome. A simple elbow orthosis can be, can be used as a uh, elbow gator for all types of uh, uh, spastic hemiplegia, you need to prevent a flexor synergy. So you have to put a elbow gator, a elbow orthosis, which keeps the elbow in straight position. But sometimes you need to prescribe a, a static progressive elbow orthosis. You suppose somebody has done a fracture uh, fixation of the radial head, fracture, distal humerus fracture fixation, where there is an intraarticular fracture likely to develop stiffness. It's our job to maintain the, uh, give the person, the patient with a functional upper limb by uh, improving the range of motion around the elbow. So here you can, uh, a, 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 this is a uh, joint is given here, uh, which is, which gives you idea about the how much of uh, the range you have gained. Okay. So uh, there are different types of joint available for this type of elbow orthosis. Other elbow orthosis uh, can be a turn buckle elbow orthosis where they are because of EIC or because of any elbow flexion, burn contracture, patient develops elbow flexion deformity. So you want to correct it, you can put a turn buckle splint also. Uh, this is a, a spreader bar. This can be used in both directions. If you want to distract it, the flexion elbow deformity will be corrected. If you want to gain range of motion, flexion range of motion, you can have a compression rod. Just come, go on tightening the knot, the threaded length will decrease. It will allow more and more flexion. So this is a beautiful concept that uh, many times you will be just fatigued by advising uh, all types of therapy, which is not helping in achieving range of motion, at least a minimum functional range of motion so that the hand can come up to the mouth. 
So this is a new tubal orthosis. You can use in either way. If it is a flexor deformity, you can correct by applying a distraction rod. If it is a, a stiff elbow, you want more flexion, you can have a compression rod, which gradually, gradually allows uh, elbow flexion by twisting the rod. Okay, so these are elbow orthosis. Bachmann's turn buckle spin. Uh, very often the flexion contracture of the forearm are common in uh, upper limb, uh, Bachmann's ischemia. There you have to see what is the grade of the uh, uh, Bachmann's ischemic contracture. If it is a mild grade or too moderate grade, it can helpful. Or if it is moderate grade, you have operated, but still you are not able to correct completely. You first as you go surgery, release all scar tissue. After that, you can apply the uh, this uh, torn buckle spin. Torn buckle is the this is the distraction rod. Is the distraction rod for so suppose patient is this is a VIC patient with this this flexion contracture, long flexion contracture. You can apply this uh, threaded rod here and gradually gradually distract it and gradually to correct the reason. It's a work very beautiful way. The even with your best effort also, you cannot correct the flexion deformity by adequate release of the long flexors. If you over lengthen it, you patient may develop with a poor grasp. But here is a, uh, is a uh, orthosis way which helps in preventing weakness of the grasp because it's a control method of stretching the long flexors. In contrast to surgical lengthen of the long flexors that land with a weakness of the hand. But this here, the weakness of the hand, chance of weakness of the hand is less. This is a Bachmann's turnbuckle spin. But only you must know where is the, what is the best indication for uh, using this one. What is the case, in which stage you should prescribe this turnbuckle spin. Then uh, different orthosis or splints used for tendinitis, tenosynovitis, enthosopathy. Basically, these are all cumulative trauma disorders. These are chronic problems, chronic degenerative problems. Uh, we, you all know about the pathology of different uh, tenosynovitis conditions. Okay, and uh, this the use of splint in these condition is that it immobilizes the affected structures in order to facilitate healing and decrease inflammation. This is the basic principle of uh, prescribing a splint in different uh, tendinitis or tenosynovitis or enthusopathy condition. Let us uh, discuss about the common conditions of tenosynovitis conditions. For example, decoreference disease is a very common condition. Here, a forearm based thumb spike splint is advised. There are a number of literatures showing its effectiveness, showing less effective. So, I have gone through certain literatures in favor of, in against of this splint. Uh, this, is, this is the uh, Journal of Hand Surgery, American volume, that says that there is a limited role of splinting in pain relief. But we prescribe it. Other journals say that. The thumb uh, ultrasound along with the thumb spica shows better outcome. This indicates that the splint is a adjunctive treatment. It is not a sole treatment. It's an adjunctive treatment, either in addition to the medication, in addition to the therapeutic modalities. Okay. And some studies also shows that when spica is added to the steroid injection, that has a better outcome than the steroid injection alone. That means the splint has a role. Okay, so another study in disability rehabilitation assistive technology, they say that there is a modified dynamic orthosis to improve pinch, pinch and radial. If you use a static splint, probably you, the, uh, the pinch and grass will be affected because there is no more motion at the MCP or CMC joint of the thumb. So the splints are developing, people are developing splints design, which allows also this uh, some amount of functional movement, not all movements. Some functional movements are allowed there with this a dynamic thumb spike spin. Then tennis elbow, one other another uh, common condition. Every OPD will find one or two tennis elbow patients along with the medical management. Along with the medical management, we uh, prescribe this splint, whether a tennis elbow or golfer's elbow whether it's extensor uh, involvement or flexor involvement, but the splint is almost applied the same position. It is around uh, two fingers breadth below the uh, lateral equipment of the 
uh, elbow joint. So that is the position. But uh, uh, this, although we all are prescribing this tennis elbow splint, but there are uh, other researches also says that depending upon the pathology, here the pathology in the common extensors. So in tennis elbow splint that act as a uh, this band that uh, changes the liver arm against which the wrist extensors pull that keeps the extensors origin at rest. So sometimes it is called that the uh, this uh, tennis elbow strap act, uh, act as a second origin of the extensor. That means the stress of the extensors at its insertion, at, uh, sorry, at its attachment to the lateral condyle is shared by this tennis elbow splint. However, the studies are still going on to see that why it will be, uh, only, only will be uh, stick to the attachment or a, a common extensor origin. We can also relax the muscle by applying a wrist splint in, in little bit dorsiflexion position. That relaxes the extensor. That also relieves pain. This, uh, this is published in European Journal of uh, Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine, 2019 volume, which shows that usefulness of wrist splint for tennis elbow. So other options are there also biomechanically, which proves correct. And one more journal on journal of shoulder elbow surgery that shows that the forearm hand spinal brace. They use this forearm hand spiral brace. This they have seen that the wrist extension splint is more effective than a forearm strap. So number of options are there. The basic function is to relieve stress over the extensors, whether below elbow or by dorsiflexing the wrist. Trigger finger. Trigger finger, uh, the goal of splinting here is the that prevents repetitive motion temporarily to allow healing. So what happened trigger finger? That is cumulative trauma, the flexor tendon sheath that causes thickening of the sheath Okay, and restriction of the tendon motion inside the thickened sheath. Okay, night splinting is a non-invasive treatment option for idiopathic trigger finger or trigger thumb with symptoms of less than three, three, three months. So this question arises whether the splinting will be effective in the daytime use or splinting will be effective in the night time use. Okay. So uh, some paper shows that the night splinting is also enough, but uh, the symptoms should be less than three months duration. If the symptoms are more than three months duration, the thickness is very much fibrous. The splinting may not be helpful. And this night splinting certainly will not be helpful. So this night splinting is only helpful for early cases of trigger finger of less than three months duration. Okay, here the functional use of the hand when the affected finger is immobilized. The principle that the affected finger must be immobilized, but rest of the finger should move. There is a the article published in the uh, Journal of Hand Microsurgery. Somebody has tried to preparing a trigger finger splint from a 50 ml syringe. You can see this picture. The 50 ml syringe is cut like this, and it is uh, a thin ethaplex is attached in the under surface of the uh, this barrel of the uh, a 50 ml syringe. This is innovative idea somebody has applied when the splint is not available. One can try with this also. Okay. okay. Not a not a. Just a minute, please. Okay, so uh, different evidences are there. One more evidence in the Journal of Hand says that shows irrevelable that so there is a weak evidence to support the use of splinting or other non operative, non -operative model designs. A single corticosteroid injection may be offered along with this. So, only splint this says that only splint is not enough. I mean, there is controversial evidence, but for symptomatic relief, to relieve the inflammation of the tendon sheath, a splint is useful. And uh, basically, this splint is helpful when the symptom is le less than three months duration.
then uh, rheumatoid arthritis rheumatoid arthritis there are different splints are used because there are number of deformities observed in rheumatoid arthritis these uh, the deformities are, are affect the small joints which are progressive in nature if no attempt is made to uh, give them rest to protect the affected joint from overuse they land with a fixed deformity once fixed deformity develop probably none of the splints will be helpful so these splints are very much useful in early stages when the deformity is just in a progressive stage okay so different splints used are depending upon the different uh, deformities ulnar deviation splint a wrist splint swan neck splint and bottonier splint okay so all these things are because of chronic synovitis uh, of the uh, uh, around the joints which causes uh, lacks of the ligaments leading to different deformities so ulnar deviation splint we have a classical uh, deformities in uh, rheumatoid arthritis it is the uh this is wrist flexion deformity ulnar deviation deformity of the at the mcp joint bottonus deformity at the pip joint and swan neck deformity at the dip joint so you all know these are the different types of splints used swan neck deformity this ring splint is helpful for both the purpose even for the bottonus for the swan neck both purpose can be used but principle is that because the both the sides the pip joint is the uh, site of pathology okay and this is the mcp joint ulnar deviation can be managed by with a ulnar deviation stop or our wrist and split with a ulnar deviation stop again there are the evidence are there are different evidence in different journals says that the benefits of wrist splinting in patients with rheumatoid arthritis says wrist stabilization improves hand function in patients with rheumatoid arthritis so we should not ignore about the uh, risk part we should not only focus to the mcp and ip joints the risk must be also splinted uh, uh, another article says that splinting and hand exercises for three common hand deformities in rheumatoid arthritis uh, a clinical prospectus says that the splinting and hand exercises exercises are most beneficial when prescribed in early and flexible stages of deformity i repeat these things Uh, the deformity must be noticed in the early stage, and early prescription of splinting can prevent a fixed deformity, which requires surgery. Osteoarthritis in upper limb, though it affects the lower limb weight-bearing joints, but CNC joint is the common joint affected by osteoarthritis, and uh, these uh, thumb spike splints, hand-based thumb uh, thumb spike splints, are very much useful for. this uh, cmc uh, affection in osteoarthritis of cmc joint this provides a functional positioning of the thumb and relieving pain and prevent deformity this is uh, uh, a hand based thumb spike splint coming to splints in different nerve injuries and related uh, related evidences that in case of radial nerve injury we all know it can be a if it is a high ulnar nerve or radial nerve injury will have wrist and finger drops both with the lower radial nerve injury there will be finger drop so the principle here is that since the extensors are weak you have to support the extensors and at the same time also you have to prevent uh, overactive the relative overactive the flexors so in in case of a radial uh, wrist drop and finger drop the hand will be remain in this position what will happen there will be uh, gradual development of the flexor long flexion contracture flexor contractures so you have to support your extensors support extensors till it recover if it is a neuropraxia it is very axonotomesis where you expect a recovery so you have to maintain the extensor length so that in the process of recovery the extensors power will regain at the same time also you prevent contracture by uh, by preventing a flexion of the wrist joint and also keep maintain the movement of the flexors you apply assistance to the extensors and the rubber the finger flexors act against the rubber band so you strengthen the, you are strengthening the flexors and also maintaining the length of the extensors that is the principle behind a uh, splinting in radial nerve uh, palsy these are splints forearm forearm based 
dorsal outrigger splints. It's a forearm based dorsal outrigger splints. These are elastic ba bands which keep the uh, tendons in extended position. Then uh, if the thumb is also affected, you have to have a uh, thumb post or assistance the thumb also. So the goal of splinting here is enhances wrist and finger extension. There are different uh, uh, prefabricated uh, splints are also available. Dynamic radial palsy splint. Different prefabricated. You can customize as per your choice or ready-made splints are also available. Median nerve palsy mostly affecting the thumb. They develop a simian hand. What is that simian hand? That the thumb, because of absence of the abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis, and adductor pollicis. So what will happen? That the thumb will be remain in the plane of the hand. The thumb will remain in the plane of the hand. Normal thumb is 90 degree to the plane of the other fingers, the plane of the hand. But in case of median nerve injury, since the short abductor extensors are absent or weak, there will be the thumb will fall back to the plane of the hand. So your aim is to keep the thumb in abducted and extended position. That is the principle of the uh, median nerve injury splinting. If you keep the thumb in that position, the rest of the fingers are working because of the, your uh, all non nerve is intact. So grasp can be improved by using this splint. Okay. So the different dynamic splints are available, static splints are available, where uh, the splint helps in keeping the thumb in abducted and extended position. All non nerve injury, if it is isolated all non nerve injury, you will have a Benedictian hand or a all nerve claw hand. If the both the nerves is a total claw hand. Okay, here, if it is total claw hand, the we normally prescribe a capnor splint. Capnor splint, either a static motion blocking splint or a capnor splint. Static, this is a static motion blocking splint where it, it uh, blocks the hyperextension of the MCP joint because of the overactivity of the long extensors against a weak intrinsic muscles. So the dorsal blocking of the MCP joint helps in uh, proper function of the long extensor tendons. So this is a static splint. You can use a uh, dynamic splint also. Uh, here it is when there is a attachment of a spring attachment. Okay, so the goal of splinting here is to prevent fixed uh, fixed flex, uh, fixed deformity at the fourth and fifth MCP joint, and also it helps in improving the function. The the spring coil design here that assists that that assists MCP flexor that assists prevents MCP extension, permits extension of the IP joint. Okay, so prevent hyper extension of the, uh, at the MCP joint and also prevents flexion or the I indirectly that prevents claw hand deformity. And this static uh, splint, that is a dorsal blocking splint, prevent hyper extension at the MCP joint so that the long extensor will work uh, actively. Okay, so this is the principle behind a ulnar uh, nerve injury, capnor splint or Benedictian splint or claw hand splint. Flapper splint. Flapper splint is used in different uh, post immobilization stiffness, prolonged spasticity with the stiffness of the fingers, where the flap is placed over the, all the fingers, all the medial four fingers, which with this elastic band that will really gradually, gradually flex the IP joints and MCP joint to have a effective grasp. Gradually, you can strengthen, increase the resistance of the elastic bands to improve, uh, increase more amount of force at the MCP and IP joint. This is a very common sprint used in case of spastic hand in long spastic hand developing stiffness at the IP and MCP joint. It is flapper sprint. So one more dynamic sprint helps in uh, radial nerve injury and extensive tendon repair. Then coming to uh, splints using the compressive neuropathy, carpal tunnel syndrome. Splint has a role, and here the splint is advised with a uh, wrist in position of 0 to 5 degree of extension. Sometimes uh, students advise cock up splint. Please never advise a cock up splint. Of course, there is there's no optimal position yet 
the position of the wrist in a carpal tunnel splint is still debatable but certainly it is not a cock up splint don't don't prescribe the cock up splint that increases tension of the ulnar nerve both extreme flexion and extreme extension both are detrimental for the carpal tunnel so prescribe a splint either in neutral position or maximum 0 to 5 degree extension but the literature says here this is article from jbjs where they have analyzed the different position at which the what is the carpal tunnel pressure they have seen that the minimum pressure is at the neutral position so preferably a neutral position splint is uh, neutral position the wrist position is uh, helpful for minimizing carpal tunnel pressure minimizing stress over the uh, median nerve okay so other studies are there also whether a soft hand brace or a wrist splint many studies are there but uh, this study this is uh, this is a uh, studies from the uh, actor neurological scandinavia so they have shown also wrist splint is very much useful for symptomatic and functional improvement in cts so wrist splint is commonly used and the confusion about the wrist position is either it is in neutral position or it is 0 to 5 degree extension but certainly not in cock up position that is 15 degree more than 15 degree of wrist extension cubital tunnel syndrome uh, second most common type of compressive neuropathy around the elbow joint where the ulnar nerve is compressed uh, in the uh, gans canal or in the behind the medial condyle of the humerus the splint here prescribed in a position with the elbow 45 degree of flexion for our neutral position you may or may not include the wrist and thumb and finger so basically the thorn should be in little bit extended position because in flexion position the nerve is maximum stressed so advisable position is 45 degree of flexion at the elbow joint okay so uh, there is a systematic review studies i have gone through that uh, it is orthopedic review in 2019 uh, they have discussed a different conjunctive treatment of cubital tunnel syndrome. And the majority of the studies, splinting was used in a multimodal fashion. No other the splint is used only alone as a treatment of cubital tunnel syndrome. It is mostly associated with other management, whether a medication or uh, uh, injection like that. So most of the studies are uh, used as a multimodal fashion. That means in the, as a adjunct therapy along with the other treatment for the cubital tunnel syndrome. Now coming to brachial plexus injury. So what is the type of brachial plexus injury? If the C6 is intact, entire up to C6 is, C6 is there, then you can use your tenodosis splint. But most of the time, the splintings are helpful because in other varieties, you can go for tenor transfer. The condition where really prescribe a uh, brachial plexus injury is in case of pan plexus injury or in early stages of plexus, pan plexus, where you are not sure whether it is pan plexus or is a recovering stages of brachial plexus injury. So here, uh, if it is pan plexus injury or the recovery stages of brachial plexus injury, you can prescribe a flail arm orthosis where there is no more motion observed at the around wrist, elbow, or shoulder band. So this is a exoskeletal uh, orthosis with a humeral cuff, which keep the humeral head against the glenoid, prevent subluxation, and some exoskeletal components exactly like a valve prosthesis. The patient can use scapular motion for flexing the elbow. Or, or by uh, improving the hand movements or improving grasp by different cable method and different elastic straps. Gunslinger splints are useful when there is a shoulder function is there, but there is a, uh, the elbow function is poor, but a hand function is there. Sorry, shoulder elbow function is not there, but hand function is there. Then gunslinger splint is allowed, uh, advised, where it is allow horizontal movement, horizontal movement of the uh, arm and forearm to grasp a object as a gone slinger splint. BIC already discussed turnbuckle splint. This uh, spinal cord injury, shortness splint, we have discussed C6, but C5 level also, splint can be advised. The splint advised the mobile arm support splint, uh, where uh, the shoulder strength is used for distal uh, hand function, same as like a uh, this uh, upper limb prosthesis using our Bowden's cable system for below elbow orthosis using the scapular protraction and retraction movements, you can have a distal, uh, distal segment function. That is for the C5 level injury where you will have 
shoulder movements will be there. C6 level already discussed that part. They say RIC splint or a tenodesis splint. Then coming to post surgical splints. Post surgical splints are especially used for in case of either a flexor tendon repair or a extensor tendon repair. The flexor tendon repair are the clinot splint. I want to describe here what is the principle behind a flexor tendon a splinting in case of flexor tendon repair. The principle is based on you support the repair tendon, you allow some movement to the repair uh, the repair tendon so that the peritendinous adhesis adhesions can be prevented. At the same time, also you have to strengthen the antagonist group of muscles, that is extensor group of muscles. So this uh, clinot splint or Duran splint they solve the, the same purpose where this uh, loop with the rubber band, this supports or assists elbow flexor. At the same time also, when you extend the finger against this resistant band, you are uh, strengthening the extensors. So by strengthening extensors, you, it, there'll be a gradual control motion of the finger, which prevents overstretching of the repair tender and also prevents peritendinous adhesions. Unless you, if you press only static spread, yes, it will allow healing of the repair tender, but at the simultaneous also, it enhances peritendon adhesions. So uh, after three months, when you will take out the sprint, patient will, uh, will not have any adequate motion for that tendon. The tendon is adhered to the surrounding structures. So flexor tendon repair, Initial three weeks, one should give a static splint in the form of plastocast or in the form of a, a polypropylene or a polyethylene brace. But followed by after three weeks, uh, one should prescribe a dynamic orthosis which supports the repair tendon at the same time also provides a control motion of the repair tendon. That is flexor tendon repair splint. The extensor tendon repair splints act in the same way. Uh, the same principle where the splint will support, assist the extensor tendons at the same time also, strengthen flexor tendons at the same time also, provides a controlled motion to prevent this peritendinous adhesions. So here the splint, extensor tendon splint is associated, will have parts like uh, with a wrist static extension, MCP, IP, dynamic extension, then active reflection of the MCV joint permitted with the constant of the spleen about 30 degrees. But I'm telling you, my purpose of telling is that we have to allow some guarded, guarded motion. So by that, you can maintain the strength of the antagonist, also support enhances healing of the repair tendon. Extensor tendon uh, injury in case of long extensor tendon injury, that is the mallet finger, the static mallet spleen is used uh, as a hyperextension, keeping the joint in hyperextension, which enhances the healing. Cross injury. Cross injury where uh, the muscles are crossed, the tendons are not defined. There is a possibility of the uh, adhesion, fibrosis of the cross muscles. So in early stages, as soon as the external wound is healed from the very beginning, the splints are used to maintain the range of motion for, for the of the uh, either flexors or extensor depending upon which compartment is injured. Burn injury is detrimental for the upper limb, especially when it is around different joints, whether around the axilla, around the elbow, around the wrist. We all have a tendency of keeping the joints in a flex position. That is the position of each. So that develops uh, the contractures at the axilla, adduction contracture at the axilla flexor contracture at the elbow and uh, your uh, contracture of the uh, wrist joint, the flexor contracture of the wrist. Just a minute. Okay, so here from the beginning, as soon as the wound becomes healthy condition, you, have, you should try to put a splint uh, to prevent uh, contracture or else if the patient has reported to you in a late stage, already contracture has happened, you should try to prevent further contracture, try to prevent mature of the uh, this uh, bone hypertrophic scar, 
and if the joint is already stiff then you have to apply a uh, orthosis which allows control motion so commonly used orthosis or splints are airplane splint airplane splint is a splint which prevents uh, used in case of burn contracts of the axilla the extended indication are uh, fracture known in the humerus after this uh, shoulder spica or u cast if the union is delayed the you have to keep the uh, arm in the abducted position so that the weight of the hand which was putting stress over the fracture side can be prevented it has been seen that a shoulder abduction hip spica shoulder spica cast or airplane splint will be helpful for delayed union of the fracture humerus also it helps in axillary bone contracture this elbow conformer splint is used for the burn injury around the elbow what is that conformer splint because patient is having a contracts around the elbow after therapeutic modalities you are gaining some range of motion uh, every alternate day so you will find in one new position you have gained some movement some movements so that uh, movements you have achieved has to maintained by a elbow conformer splint mostly they are used by used with uh, low uh, temperature thermoplastic splints burn injury around the hand the static splint in the early stages should be used with wrist in 5 to 15 degree of extension mcp 60 to 70 degree of flexion and ip in extension thumb between radial abduction and extension this is the position of the splinting any sort of burn burn around the hand okay so this is burn injury hand this is the typical position of a functional splint for burn injury of the hand in different uh, paralytic conditions hemiplegia uh, brain injury head injury splints are also prescribed and uh, with the aim that the that prevents contracture and deformity reduces muscle strain uh, stone by providing a sustained constant and sustained stress the muscles across a joint and also it prevents edema subluxation of the shoulder joint as you see in this case very often prescribe a humeral cup with a figure eight harness humeral cup with a opposite shoulder strap like that the aim is objective is to keep to prevent shoulder subluxation keep the humeral again head against gravity till the rotator cuff muscles are recovered till the uh, the tone of the uh, muscles of the deltoid and the rotator cuff muscles are recovered till then you have to splint it okay other splints you use are mobile arm support axillary sling humeral cup with figure eight harness resting hand splint very often use resting hand splint what is that purpose what is the position of the resting hand splint resting hand splint must be positioned with wrist in slight extension mcp in slight flexion ip joint in extension thumb is position in between palmar and radial abduction which reduces the muscle tone of the hand the whole purpose of the hand is it's not a functional splint functional splint is 90 degree mcp flexion but here the mcp joint is is slightly flexed the purpose here is to have a sustained stress to the long flexor group of muscles okay which is very open spastic the flexor carpal ulnar stretching is very open spastic thumb position thumb in palm prevention so this resting hand splint will have all these effects if you look this resting hand splint you have you should have a c bar here you should have a thumb post here with the mcp around uh, uh, little bit flexion and ip joint in extension okay so this is the position and depending upon how much it is stretch if it is stretchable then put in full extension again so these are different forms of uh, resting hand splint so uh, to conclude a basic knowledge of upper limb orthosis will definitely help not only providing a uh, bone union also better functional recovery in all types of surgical conditions all types of the inflammatory or arthritic conditions or surgical repair or uh, different uh, disease conditions so a basic knowledge on splint 
principle of splinting why are you splinting what is the extension of the splint what is the duration of the splinting what is the time of use of the splinting all these things should have you should have basic knowledge for prescribe the splinting it is not that just advising the splinting uh, go to po department go to prosthetic ortho so you are the person who will decide what type of splint need to be given you are the person who will decide the what type of customization need to be done for a particular uh, condition so it's the splint is not as like a generalized just write a cock up splint so that is the prescription of a, uh, a non pmr person any any uh, whether it may be a neurologist or it may be orthopedist and it may be plastic surgeon that is their role they will just prescribe a splint but it is the physiatrist who knows about the what is the exact extent of the splint what is the exact uh, duration of the splint what is the principle of the splint what is the uh, customization of the splint what exact modification need, uh, is required for a particular condition okay so uh, for all youngsters uh, since most of the institute they don't have a separate prosthetic orthopedic department i have seen so they are poor in this uh, this orthosis please uh, have a look this presentation during your uh, in the it's available on youtube also it will be available on youtube and also go through the books also you will find that uh, different dimensions different indications in this way so with uh, this i will uh, stop here it's already time 8:45 Uh, if, if there is, if there is any question please uh, uh, open up and you can ask uh, any type of question and if any senior members are there with us uh, they can give their comments thank you sir am i audible sir yes yes sir audible uh, sir thank you for a wonderful presentation i think uh, you have covered in biomechanics and uh, classification and basic principles along with the uh, evidences behind the orthosis in very elaborated and comprehensive manner uh, i again invite the questions from the audience uh, actually i have uh, already put an message for uh, uh, the questions but i don't find any question in chat box if uh, anyone want to ask anything please uh come in front please put his question dr nihal uh, uh want to ask the any recent evidence in support of elastic or thermoplastic splint for preventing the dislocation of the shoulder in hemiplegia i tried through some literature some systematic reviews but none of the uh, uh, systematic review had a confirmatory message that this splint is used in for the shoulder subluxation they have varied of evidences some uh, some uh, says uh, along with the stimulation to rotator cuff stimulation to the deltoid along with the splinting part but none of the splints are confirmatory whether axillary splint or a thermoplastic splint or a elastic bandage so none of the splints is better over the other okay thank you sir any more questions Sir, till now we don't have any questions. So, what is your orders? <laughs> Then we can stop it here. Uh, okay. Sir. Already time eight. And uh, uh, my advice. I was, I was expect expecting question from our students. <laughs> yes. <sir. laughs> uh, and last, uh, my advice to all audience that uh, participating in this uh, webinar is not sufficient. Please go uh, that. Uh, what is the purpose of putting the this these videos in uh, youtube these are for revision purpose until unless you are not going to revise it you will not mug up with it so uh, please everyone go and also uh, please start practicing in uh, your clinics what uh, we are learning in uh, the webinars uh, so that uh, by doing these uh, we will mug up with these things okay thank you sir so uh, see for preparing this presentation somebody has to take lot of effort to prepare this so this presentation should not go to waste uh, try yes, to sir. go through this uh, presentation i hope uh, you will get benefit certainly uh, in your clinical practice so before closing uh, there is customary since i am organizing this i have to give a word of thanks to uh, all participants and especially the thanks to the pr team of the iapmr who is 
uh, preparing this uh, link and uh, giving us the platform, Zoom platform uh, for this webinar and also publicizing this webinar in different platform. And uh, I must thank all the office bearers of uh, Odisha Association of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation, APMRO, as well as uh, the office bearers of Indian Association of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation for supporting us uh, in conducting this webinar. Fortunately, hopefully uh, our some of our seniors have given consent uh, for presentation in near future. The probably the next uh, presentation will be on uh, lower limb uh, orthosis by uh, one of the senior most faculty, Dr. B. D. Athanasar. He has uh, today he has given his consent for presenting the the his uh, presentation. I hope uh, we all will join and enjoy the academic piece with the presentation by the Dr. Dr. Athani. Until then, uh, I'm uh, stopping here. I once again thank everybody who has whoever has joined this webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.